I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. That war was an emergency. It was on our mind every single hour of the day. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for rights. When they said, I'm black and I'm proud, that meant something. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Thank you. I think an era ended with Robert Kennedy's death. Uh, an era in which we could have accomplished great things. I think there's an amount of bitterness and animosity that our generation is going to carry to its grave. in Vietnam was at the heart of 1968, a heart of darkness. It was the first televised war and the images were inescapable. By the beginning of 1968, there were nearly half a million U.S. troops in Vietnam. More than 15,000 Americans had died there. Never before in American history had such a vast number of people mobilized to protest a war. I speak out against this war, not in anger, but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart, and above all with a passionate desire to see our beloved country and as the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I'm disappointed with America. Why are you marching? Well, uh, I am personally marching with the Painters Union here in San Francisco, and we're uh, attempting to protest the war in Vietnam. You think this is going to help? I hope so. <laughs> Either that or a revolution, one or the other. The powerful in our country had ceased to be responsible. And so the powerless, students, poor people, were trying to take some responsibility and say, here's how things should go. One politician dared to come forward. Eugene McCarthy, a senator from Minnesota, decided to run for president as a peace candidate, challenging Lyndon Johnson in the New Hampshire primary. McCarthy, the outsider, more poet than politician, attracted a loyal army of college students. It became known as the Children's Crusade. On the Republican side, Richard Nixon, a veteran of the Cold War, was trying to come back from the dead. The presidential race was barely underway when all hell broke loose. During the Tet Lunar New Year at the end of January, Vietnamese communists launched their biggest offensive of the war, simultaneously attacking all the major cities and towns in South Vietnam. The surprise attack stunned Americans, especially when they watched on television as Viet Cong guerrillas stormed the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Now CIA men and MPs have gone into the embassy and are trying to get the snipers out by themselves. The Tet Offensive failed militarily. The Vietnamese communists were driven out of the cities. But the fighting went on for more than a month and shattered forever the illusion of American omnipotence. Of all the nightmarish images that haunted Americans, the one that lingered longest was this, South Vietnam's police chief coldly executing a suspected Viet Cong guerrilla. These ruins are in Saigon, capital and largest city of South Vietnam. They were left here by an act of war 
I went to Vietnam in 68 because of the Tet Offensive. The fact that uh, despite all of the propaganda that if they could mount such an offensive when we had been told we were winning this war. It was a momentous moment when Cronkite got up out of his chair uh, and went to Vietnam and came back with these famous reports that the war was unwinnable and that we should look for an honorable way out. Well, Walter Cronkite didn't do things like that. This district used to be a model of pacification. Now again, most of it is at the mercy of the enemy. Correspondent Robert Shackney talked to Captain Donald Jones, Deputy Pacification Advisor for the district. I walked unarmed with just one major casually through Go Boy in December. Could I do it today? No, you could not. You could not walk through Go Boy today. Are you discouraged? Yes. I was told by the military management of the war that with another 150,000 or 200,000, perhaps 300,000 troops, we could now finish the job. Well, that's what they'd been telling us for five years. Give us another 10,000, give us another 50,000. This sounded to me like more of the same. And uh, I came back with the conclusion that we were mired in stalemate and that the best thing for us to do was to acknowledge this fact, to negotiate with the people who had done the very best they could and, uh, and get out. George Christian, uh, who was Johnson's press secretary, said later that when Cronkite said what he said about the war, it was as if an earthquake had gone through the White House. The Vietnam War was the wheel on which the American establishment was broken and Tet was the breaking point. The Tet Offensive gave life to the McCarthy campaign, which was now attracting celebrities like Paul Newman. You have areas where you feel your own rumblings and your own dissension and your own questioning. Then I think it's necessary to get behind the senator now. I liked McCarthy. I always did. I disagreed with him on the war. But the truth is his campaign was magnificent up there in New Hampshire. Uh, he ran a, a very classy campaign. It was an intellectual's campaign, but it wasn't egghead like Stevenson. He had a wonderful sense of humor, and the people who were behind McCarthy, those kids, the be clean for Gene kids, we would see them all over because we'd cross paths in New Hampshire. Uh, they were not radicals. They were intellectual, uh, and uh, they would pick at our motel, and I would go out and talk to them and argue with them. McCarthy and his student volunteers captured nearly 43 percent of the vote, humiliating President Johnson. It was a symbolic upset with enormous repercussions. Immediately, Robert Kennedy, who had been vacillating like Hamlet, announced he too would run for president. It was Lyndon Johnson's worst political nightmare. Good evening, my fellow Americans. Tonight I want to speak to you of peace in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. No other question so preoccupies our people. On March 31st, Johnson announced a partial bombing halt of North Vietnam and called for peace talks. Then he dropped a bombshell of his own. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. People felt that they had won. A man whose uh, political power was uh, immense, uh, who had accomplished so much for evil and good, had suddenly said, I quit. You're often amazed when things that you devoutly wish for actually come to pass. And this was one of those moments. It seemed anything could happen now. It was the magic of 1968. McCarthy or Kennedy might be president. The war might actually end. For those who wanted social change, it was the high point of 1968, a moment of pure euphoria.